Uh, let's welcome in now our good friend from NFL Film, senior producer Greg Cosell, uh, joins us usually on Friday. So here he is in the offseason doing that very thing. Uh, so, Greg, thanks for joining us, number one. Um, and, you know, the Bills, I don't know if you could say they've swung big in free agency. Nobody really anticipated that they would because they were, right. you know, tight against the cap, as you know. Um, but they've made, you know, a, a fair amount of signings here, most of them of the budgetary variety. Um, but they handed out a nice contract to the receiver, Curtis Samuel, from Washington, yeah. who obviously Brandon Bean knows well because he was still with the Carolina Panthers when he was drafted by that franchise back in 2016. So, you know, I know you kind of live re relatively close to the NFC East, you know, being in the Philadelphia area, so you see a lot of those games. Uh, what are your thoughts on what the Bills are getting in Curtis Samuel that you think he can add to their offense? Well, I think, to, to me, one of the things that immediately stands out about Samuel is the fact that he can line up in so many different spots within your offense. And I always think that in today's NFL, that's a really good trait to have for a receiver. I mean, we've seen other teams do that. You know, we've seen these teams now in the league use a ton of motion, a ton of uh, formation variation with receivers that can line up in multiple locations with, within the formation. I think Samuel brings that. Um, when he's been healthy, he's a very physical guy. Um, so, you know, we, I, we've seen him line up in the backfield. Uh, I, I think he's a really intriguing guy within the context of this offense. Uh, I, th I think we all agree they need receivers. I, I would like to hope this does not preclude them from taking one in the draft as well. Um, I, obviously, you guys know it's a, um, a high-level receiver draft. I'm sure that there's receivers in the second, third round that they would feel very comfortable taking. But I think Samuel is a definite upgrade at a position of need for the Bills. Um, is, go ahead. Is Ste if Curtis Samuel, is he, he – and I, don't, I know you, you know what I'm saying when I say this. I hope, I hope I'm not being too, you know, off the wall. But is Curtis Samuel's different enough from Steph Diggs – to be a different type of receiver. I mean, it seems to me maybe these guys are a little too, like, you know what I'm saying, too much alike. Um, I mean, and, and I don't know, even if they are, and I'm not sure that that's 100% true, but I don't know if that's an issue, you know, right. because ultimately, you know, what, what we saw them do with Diggs this past year, and, you know, uh, uh, barring anything unforeseen, I'm sure Diggs will be back, um, is now you have multiple guys that can line up anywhere. And I think that, right. that that's never a problem, Steve. You know, right. I think I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it such that the defense has to sort of figure this out, um, both pre-snap and post-snap. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily an issue, it, it, even if you do feel that they're somewhat alike. Um, yeah, that, I would that, say at this point in his career, assuming health, that Samuel probably gives gives you a little more juice than Stephon Diggs. Well, yeah, it would be great. Was, yeah, give me two Stephon Diggs. I get, I get that. Uh, I was thinking more about body type, the type of player right. he is. You need the big time, um, you know, the big 6'4 guy. Are, I think Samuel's a little thicker in his build. Um, maybe a little more physical just in, in the manner in which he plays um, because he's been used as a running back. I yeah, mean, that's the right. thing. I mean, I remember him at, at Ohio State. There were times he lined up and carried the ball as an offset back and, and had big runs. Right, and I, I kind of foresee Joe Brady tapping into that because that's what he did when he had him in Carolina in 2020. Um, yeah. His, Curtis Samuel's most productive season – in the NFL was with Joe Brady as his offensive coordinator. How much yeah. of an advantage is that for Buffalo's offense with Brady already having a wealth of knowledge as to what Samuel is capable of? Well, let me, let me put it in these terms. And then there's another free agent that they signed that I'd love to talk about, but let me put that in this, these terms. When I talk to coaches at the combine and, and the Niners come up in conversation, one of the things I always hear is they are very difficult to play against because of the, the Debo Samuel and McCaffrey situation, because you don't know where they're going to line up. So now you have Samuel and James Cook. Now I'm not suggesting James Cook is McCaffrey. That's not my point. 
uh, in terms of talent. But Cook now, now that Brady is going to be there as the OC for the entire offseason, and we know that Cook can detach from the formation and be one of those players as well, now you have two guys, and, and not that it's an exact match for McCaffrey and Debo, but you have a similar type situation. And as I said, all I heard from a lot of people at the Combine was how difficult that is. How deep at the top of this draft does the wide re receiver position go? Um, how many guys do you think are good enough to be taken inside the top 32? Possibly seven. Possibly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Who are the I bottom? Mean, who are the bottom three? <laughs> well, I mean, you just put up a list. I mean, the top three are probably the top three. Um, yeah. I would say the next two for me, you know, and again, depending on order, are are for sure. Uh, speed always plays. I mean, Worthy is a speed guy. There will be people concerned about, you know, his size uh, and his weight, but speed always rules in the NFL. Um, you know, McConkey is. I, I loved his tape. I think we've spoken about him. Yep. Um, I could see someone looking at Troy Franklin and saying, oh, that guy's got some speed. I mean, he's another smooth burner. So is it possible? I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, who I think, you know, but I think seven could go in the top 32. All right. So let's let's go to the other receiver that Buffalo signed and Mac Hollins. Uh, you know, it's it's a relatively under the radar type move, but. I think for all intents and purposes, Mac Hollins is going to be able to do a lot of what Gabe Davis did in this offense, and he's going to do it for one twelfth the price for what he signed in Jacksonville. And I think he's a better receiver between the numbers. Um, he's a big kid. Um, he's a great special teams player, by the way. Um, he's a great guy, and I think that he, there's a physicality to his game. He actually, when he came out of college, believe it or not, I believe it was North Carolina, he yes. could freaking run. I mean, he had all these big explosive plays. Yeah, he um, played with Trubisky once, there. Yeah, every once in a while that shows up in the league. But, I mean, you can see with some of these highlights catching the ball on inbreakers with his hands. Um, you know, he's a guy – look, I'm not going to sit here and say he's going to catch 75 balls in this offense, but he's a big, physical, fast receiver who, for whatever reason, never has really been able to, to be a volume receiver in the league. But he's – He's one of those under the radar intriguing signings to me. Yeah, and and he is you know that quintessential big bodied type dude. And yeah. you're right. Uh, if you're looking for you know to to build a roster, a guy like Mac Hollins who can play special teams, like you said, uh, is a guy that probably is going to be active on game day. He's always going to be active on game day, and he helps you with your roster as well. Because, Steve, look, you know special teams way better than I, so I'm not going to presume to know more than you do. You know way more. But you want those guys who can play great special teams but also figure meaningfully into a position because then it allows you to have another roster spot for someone else that can help you in whatever area that is. Right. Right. Um, a guy that uh, played right under your nose uh, last season for the Eagles looks like a depth addition at the linebacker spot. For Buffalo and Nicholas Morrow, um, yeah, I know he had the green dot and he had to actually start some games due to injury. You know, for the Eagles last year, we see him as a depth piece. But what do you see in terms of his skill set, Greg? I'm going to have to be honest here, guys, and I hope that no one's going to like hang up or turn the turn off the. Uh, he wasn't very good in Philly last year, to be honest okay. with you, and. Um, you can't sign him and expect him to start. And I think you're right; he'd be a depth piece probably a special teams player as well. Um, he was one of the issues in Philadelphia, to be quite honest. I mean, I can only tell you what the tape shows. You know, that's what I do. Um, you know, he's had some good seasons in the league, but last year was a difficult one for him. Um, can he get back to things he showed previously? That's hard to say. Uh, but, yeah, he struggled quite a bit this past year. But can I mention one other defensive signing that I really liked? Yeah. Sure. I think Mike Edwards is a really good signing. Yeah, um, yeah. I love that kid ever since he came out of Kentucky. He's played in the league now. What did he come out around 2017, Brownie? Somewhere around there. Yes. That, 16. That seems I want to ring say. a bell. Yeah. I I've always liked him a lot. He was with Tampa when they won a Super Bowl, playing safety. He can play on the back end. He can play in the box. 
Um, he's physical. He's aggressive. He's smart. Um, obviously, he was with Kansas City in recent years, so he's won Super Bowls. Um, so I, I thought that was a really, really good signing. You know, he's not a guy a lot of people think about as being, oh, this guy's a great safety. But I just think he's one of those really solid players that every defense needs on the back end. And we know that they needed to replace Hyde and Poyer. And I think Edwards is a really good fit. With the proliferation, Greg, of more split safety looks, I – I don't. You can tell me what you think about this. I think some of his strengths are maximized because of that. Would you agree with that? Yes, and keep in mind that one of the things that the, the, the Chiefs played a ton of split safety, and it wasn't quarters the way people think of quarters. It was kind. It looked like quarters, but they played a lot of two shell behind pressure. And if you talk to Steve Spagnolo, he'll tell you it's not really quarters in a strict sense. But the point is, it's still two shell. And I think that Mike Edwards can play that really, really well. Yeah, Edwards came out in 2019. Is oh, when nice. he oh 2019. Yeah, yeah he, he was, played his first I, four I remember years. watching him in Kentucky. I remember talking to Todd Bowles about him at the Combine a number of years ago when he still was with Tampa. And um, I just think he's a really solid football player. Yeah, he came out in – he was with Tampa for four years. He was only one year with Kansas City last year. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so he's – but he's won two Super Bowls. That's yeah. right. One with Tampa and one, one with the yeah. Chiefs. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of uh, the two-hill kid? Uh, I see a high-motor player there. Obviously, he was buried on a depth chart in Washington, um, you know, behind two former first-round picks in Big, Sweat yeah. and, and Young. Um, but the, he's got a little juice to him. Uh, I found him interesting just kind of watching him after yeah. the Bills picked him up. Another, you know, it kind of fits what we've always talked about with the Bills, Brownie. Another tall, long defensive end, okay? Yeah. Um, came out of Stanford, as I recall. He was originally drafted by the Eagles and then went to Washington. He got a lot of playing time this year because they got rid of Sweat and Young. And you know what? He shows up on tape once in a while. Obviously, he's not an explosive, sudden mover, but he's long. He moves pretty well, as you're seeing here. Um, be very interesting how he sort of fits and how many snaps he gets. Um, yep. But he's, he, you know, he's one of those guys, another one of those guys that's, you know, worth having on your roster. And yeah, and, I, yeah, I, I go just, ahead. I, I, this just came to mind to me the other day, and I said it on the air. He's, he kind of reminds me of another guy they got from Washington. He's like Trent Murphy with a little more athleticism. Yeah, I remember Trent Murphy. Yeah, I remember he came out of Stanford too. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, but no, Cahill's, a, look, we all know at this time of year, you know, there not every signing is an, oh my God, that's a wow signing. You're looking for competition. You're looking for depth. You're looking to make your roster better. And, you know, you hope that all these guys you sign ultimately do that. It's impossible now on May, uh, on March 22nd to figure out playing time or number of snaps or all that. That's, that's an impossibility, but you're just looking for depth and more competition to make your team better. Has there been any surprises for you that that did make you say, oh, wow, that's a great sign is, across the league? I mean, no, the Kirk Cousins signing is probably the headliner the entire offseason so far because of, you know, the career he's had and what possibly awaits him in Atlanta. Any other names surprise you? Yeah, I, I, I tell you, and I'd be curious, you know, not that you guys are studying this in detail, but I was kind of surprised that it seems that at this moment in time, the league has told Justin Fields that he's not a starting quarterback. Yeah. And again, I think Fields has some clear concerns that show up on tape every week. But for a guy who's played three years in the league and has made you know his share of big explosive plays, and the way everybody now talks about quarterbacks that can you know play above the X's and O's, I found it fascinating. And I'm not making a judgment here. The league made the judgment for us. But the league kind of told us that they do not see Justin Fields as a starting quarterback. Yeah, especially when the compensation is a sixth-round draft choice. Um, yeah. But how do you <laughs> – I, I know you, you're not in the prediction business, Greg, but it's curious to me that you have Russell Wilson, who's 36 years old, essentially playing for cheap because Pittsburgh's only got to shell out a little over a million dollars for him with you know, Denver picking up the rest of the tab. But – Fields contract's going to be up after this year as well. Yeah. And if you're starting Wilson, which is what Tomlin has gone on record saying, how are you going to know what you have in Fields before he hits free agency short of an injury to Wilson? You know, 
again, I'm not Mike Tomlin, and I don't presume to speak for him or know what's in his head. But all I would say is it's mid-March. Let's see how this plays out when the season starts. You know, we don't know the answer to that. Players and coaches say a lot of things in the offseason. You guys know that. And then things do change. So let's wait and see on that. If it plays out the way you say, then it's it's a really difficult situation for Justin Fields because then he ends up being essentially a backup quarterback and he's going to get backup quarterback money. Yeah, he's and, and I th- I'll say this, though, if Pittsburgh is going to have an entire year to evaluate him on and off the field, they may not see him in games, but they're going to see him every day in practice. Yeah. They'll watch him and they'll understand what he they'll get to know him and yeah. they will have obviously an inside track by setting a value to him and saying, listen, we'll give you a one year deal now. And now Russell Wilson's done. You can come in. We're going to let you start here. And we'll give you a one-year prove-it deal, right? Or, or we'll, and you know that kind of thing. So, uh, it is, and for a sixth-round pick, or the the price that Pittsburgh paid to get him, it seems like a pretty smart move if they can evaluate him accurately. Yeah, and and you, your point is great, and I think a lot of fans don't think of it that way. They're with him every day now, right? So they're going to know what he is both off the field, on the field, meetings, you know, all those things that go into it. I mean, that's a great point. They're going to know him so well at starting very soon, and uh, and they'll know whether, hey, this guy could be our future quarterback because Wilson's – I mean, I don't know how long Russell Wilson wants to play. I don't know what level he can still play at. Um, he's a certain kind of quarterback at this point in his career, and we'll see how that all plays out. Last thing quickly before we let you go, Greg, with Mitch Morris becoming a salary cap casualty and signing in Jacksonville, the general consensus up here, at least from the reports that we've heard, is the intention is to slide Connor McGovern into the pivot and let David Edwards, who re-signed, man the left guard spot. And we know he's been a starter in the league, so that's not the concern. But Bills fans are concerned about Connor McGovern being penciled in to the center spot. Uh, knowing that he only has 100 career snaps at center. I know he played his entire, I think, freshman or sophomore season at Penn State at center. It's not completely foreign to him, but he he doesn't have a lot of reps at this level, and that's kind of caused some concern amongst fans. Uh, What do you think about his position flex ability? Well, I think if you're just looking, quite frankly, as as, – uh, you know, as, a, as an abstraction, as we're talking, you think he can handle it. We're not going to know that until we, you know, start going through real games, to be honest. I mean, obviously, they'll have a feel for it going through OTAs, mini camp, training camp, all that. Um, will they draft an interior lineman, you know, someone who can play center? They could well do that. You know, you can get those guys later in a draft. You don't have to do that in the first or second round. And unless someone that they love, you know, falls to, again, you know, offensive linemen, particularly interior offensive linemen, are not sexy picks. You guys know that. But they pick 28th, right? Yep. Right. So let's right. say let's say the kid from Oregon sitting there, you know, Jackson Powers Johnson, who I've done and is a really good prospect. Uh, and again, I have no idea how, you know, the guys up there think. I couldn't tell you that. I have no idea how, you know, the, the, the brass thinks. But let's say he's sitting there at 28th and they love him and he's the 19th best player on their board. You know, maybe you draft him. You know, it might not be a sexy pick, but it might be a pick that you feel, well, you know, hey, <laughs> we just shored up we, an area that we need to shore up. Greg, we, you were sitting here every day asking our listeners, have the Bills gotten to a point, you know, with, with Mike Edwards, with, you know, Mac Hollins, with Curtis Samuel, with all these guys they're signing, have they gotten to a spot where they can take whoever they want on the board? In the first round all the way through. Can they take Um, the best player? And the question is, (laughs) not quite. (laughs) No, I mean, look, here's what you'd love to see. I mean, I'm just giving you my opinion based on film. I think you'd love to see them get one of those kind of pass rushers where you say, we have to account for him. Now, that may not happen at 28. I'm just saying, I think that's what you'd love to see. Um, Look, you could argue their offensive line was very good last year. I think, were they the only team in the league that started the same five all year? Yeah, they didn't so, miss yeah. any games. Yeah. Yeah, and, and by the way, that's very rare. That may not happen again for right. the Bills. I mean, I'd be very surprised if it does. Right. You know? So, 
you know, sometimes you have to make picks that make your team better that the fans don't view as, uh, like I said, a real sexy, you know, everybody wants a pass rusher. Everybody wants that big time wide receiver. Everybody wants an explosive weapon. You know, everybody wants to shut down corner. You know, sometimes you have to pick, just pick really good players that make your team better. Yeah. That's totally fair. I get it. Um, Greg, thanks as always for the time. Have a great weekend. We'll catch up with you later on here in the off season. Thanks. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. 